Good morning, and thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, everyone, once again, for uh, being such gracious hosts. I've enjoyed uh, the time I've spent with you and certainly with uh, uh, many of you in conversation after the lectures, uh, as well as over uh, a very fine meal yesterday. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and honor. Yesterday, we tracked the story of oil and religion from the 1860s to approximately the 1960s and focused much of our attention on the politicization of wildcat Christianity at mid-century as it wrestled with major oil and the fits and starts that accompanied uh, wildcatters' efforts to revive their rule of capture on North American soil. As we saw with the example of the Great Canadian Oil Sands Project, this uh, diplomacy was truly a multinational, multi-leveled affair with preachers, politicians, engineers, and born-again CEOs exercising power together. This morning, I'd like to extend our story into the 1980s when wildcat Christianity was truly politically ascendant and into our current moment during which di dissenting voices have emerged in the careers of two people in particular, one historical, the other contemporary, we are exposed to an alternative strand of thinking that has been every bit as instrumental in our modern encounters with the black stuff as the strands that I have highlighted thus far. These two individuals also need to be foregrounded because it is their legacies that are helping generate the debates around so much of our current petrol politics swirl. And then as we close, we'll ponder uh, briefly how past and future trajectories of God and black gold look as we contemplate the global exchanges of people and resources, money and power, faith and imaginations that have made the confidences of Crude's first generations succumb to doubts about the world they created. To be sure, the work that these generations completed came with certain permanence. Before we transition to present issues like the Keystone Pipeline, it's worth returning to the moment when the landscape that now produces the oil for transport in this steel line was christened by its architects. We concluded last night with the tale of the great Canadian oil sands. Through their evangelical ecumenism, J. Howard Pugh, Ernest Manning, Billy Graham, and R.G. Letourneau managed to inaugurate a mammoth enterprise. By 1967, the Sunoco's quarter billion dollar investment had facilitated the amassing of workers and, suppl and supplies from around the globe into an enormous complex able to extract one of the world's largest single energy resources. There was another indicator of these men, their wildcat peers success in tipping petroleum, uh, petroleum scales in their favor. By the late 1960s, Canada had become central to American oil's foreign outlook. Even as the Middle East captured ever increasing attention, US imports from Canadian oil sources rose dramatically from 4.9% of total US oil imports in 1958 to nearly 20% in 1967. This compared to 8.3% from the Middle East. Within this unfolding reality, Alberta's oil sands became ever more appealing. Not all was rosy for the great Canadian oil sands, however. By the time it entered its third year, uh, the oil sands uh, was slumping under the weight of heavy costs due to production difficulties, financial strains, and Albertans who demanded their share of the profits. Still, Sunoco's relations with Alberta's government would remain steady throughout the 1970s, thanks in part to their continued claims to shared religion. After Ernest Manning's retirement in 1968, Sunoco struck a rapport with Harry Strom, Manor's, uh, Manning's successor. A prairie populist in Manning's mold, Strom was also a new evangelical who endorsed Graham's ministry and Pew's worldview. One of his first trips after accepting the premiership of Alberta was to Washington, D.C., where he attended Richard Nixon's presidential prayer breakfast, an event assisted by Graham and Pugh. Strom returned home, determined to make his religion count in the political realm. Alberta citizens who continued to hold firm to the social credits, political and religious heritage, hailed his devotion. In its new leader, the province of Alberta, they 
uh, one commentator wrote, has a man for whom the word honor carries a deeper meaning. The Honorable Harry Strom, Premier of Alberta, seeks also to honor Jesus Christ. Strom stayed loyal to Sunoco. In 1970, he reduced the royalties it was required to pay to the Alberta people, easing the company's burdens, but stirring the wrath of political opponents, who said that the act was, quote, an outrageous concession to a subsidiary of a giant multinational corporation one of Ernie Manning's, uh, Ernest Manning's fears. Sunoco officials monitored the backlash, and behind the scenes, they negotiated all the more urgently with Strom and the Alberta government. In one of the last meetings of his life, Pew convened with Strom in May 1970, at which time Strom pledged to help the great Canadian oil sands, regardless of the political heat. Despite being in the midst of planning Honor America Day, his culminating ventures in religion and politics, Pew saw his meeting with Strom as essential. Pew died a short time later. Even with Strom's aid, Great Canadian Oil Sands limped forward, suffering from its, uh, its inability to counter rising production costs and charges from environmentalists that the tar sands project caused ecological harm. By the 1980s, Great Canadian Oil Sands would give way to government ownership, and with the added stability would come another era of fits and starts, but also significant growth and progress. As Strom's dealings with Pew and Nixon suggest, the religious and political weight that went into the Oil Sands project was no isolated endeavor. It was, one could say, further evidence of a power shift that was already rocking U.S. politics. As you've heard yesterday evening, uh, the revolution had started really with Dwight Eisenhower's use of the Tidelands issue to generate Republican support in the solid Democratic South. The GOP's momentum uh, in the South, especially the Southwest, also accelerated with Barry Goldwater, the Arizona senator who in 1964 vied for leadership of the Republican Party by rallying uh, Southwesterners around a new conservative politics. To the surprise and the great dismay of his East Coast detractors, both Democrats and Republicans, Goldwater proved highly efficient in the rallying Despite facing stiff odds, he assembled an army of grassroots activists who turned the GOP upside down in his favor. His opponent was Nelson Rockefeller, whose life and career in oil and diplomacy had been seen as a stepping stone to what he really wanted, the political power that came with the presidency. But Rockefeller's day was yesterday, Goldwater's today. He used, Rockefeller uh, used his speech at the 1964 GOP convention in San Francisco to warn his fellow Republicans of the rising right-wing revolt that seemed destined to destroy his party. The Republican Party is in real danger of subversion by a, a radical, well-financed, and highly disciplined minority, he bellowed over top the angry hisses that echoed through the conservative heavy audience. But his was an exercise in futility, and he knew it for the GOP's establishment was in no position by that juncture to reverse the rightward turn. Goldwater, meanwhile, announced this turn during his own speech at the 1964 Republican Convention in San Francisco, at which time he proclaimed, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Such was Goldwater's articulation of wildcat principles for the masses. Although he won over his party's conservative faithful, signaling a revolt within, Goldwater failed to win the national opinion, uh, signal signaling the work that those on the Republican right still needed to do before the White House would be theirs. It was left up to Ronald Reagan, of course, to build on Goldwater's foundations. He did so by trimming the harsher edges of Goldwater conservatism and advocating an agenda of creative conservatism a forward-looking vision of reform that could win over the silent majority of Americans who were frustrated by the cultural revolutions and secular drifts of the 1960s. After winning two terms as governor of California, Reagan waited for his turn at the presidency. 
In the meantime, it was Richard Nixon who rode creative conservatism into power, first in 1968, then in 1972. Besides applying Reagan's approach on a national stage, Nixon also tapped the Californians' connections to oil. Reagan's closest advisors, in fact, were all independent oilmen. And Nixon also learned how to speak as a citizen of the oil patch. During the energy crisis of the 1970s, he leaned heavily on, on Southern silent majority uh, uh, citizens for encouragement and support. While the Northeast shivered in the cold and endured long gas lines, Nixon's Southern constituents chided their fellow citizens, save energy, let a Yankee freeze in the dark. <laughs> the Goldwater, Reagan, Nixon appeals to the oil patch didn't go unnoticed. While Kevin Phillips' political treatise, The Emerging Republican Majority, outlined a strategy of free market family values that the GOP could use to break the Democratic South and turn it Republican red, Kirkpatrick Sale offered a more critical journalistic account of current trends by exposing, uh, as he saw it, the shared interests of Southwestern oil and the new conservative GOP. The power shift that had come through these connections, he lamented, had devastated the country for good. Sale overstated things and painted events in conspiratorial terms. As I've tried to show these past uh, few lectures, the rise of wildcat Christianity was no collusion of economic interests, but the result of a complex marriage of ideas and beliefs human experiences and economic concerns triggered by a people's peculiar encounters with land. Still, Sale identified a source of the political transformation that by the 1970s had assumed stress, special traction in American society. So central to this transformation, of course, was evangelicalism itself. Scholars have said much about how evangelicals seized their opportunity for mainstream status in the 70s by creating a born-again movement and also by waging culture wars. Historian Stephen Miller describes the period between 1970 and 2008 as the age of evangelicalism, during which, quote, born-again Christianity provided a language, medium, and foil by which Americans came to terms with political and cultural changes. Although generated by a host of issues and expressions of authority in the cultural, social, and political realms, this age of evangelicalism was also a product of the long developing upward trajectories of wildcat Christianity in which evangelicalism was always so at home. The evidence of wildcat Christianity's born again moment was indeed everywhere. Uh, a few examples. Uh, here, consider, for instance, Graham uh, and Nixon again partnering in wooing the oil patch south, uh, a region that Billy Graham, as we heard last night, was very familiar with. Or consider the, again, uh, import of peak oil theory, uh, which uh, again ar uh, arose in the 1950s, something that Ernest Manning was familiar with, but really came to have traction, uh, popular traction uh, in the 1970s as the United States weathered OPEC and uh, cutbacks to uh, gasoline in the 1970s. Or John Walvard, uh, a theologian at Dallas Seminary, also an authority on premillennialism, who uh, uh, was, uh, again, outspoken and one of the more popular uh, writers of apocalyptic literature in the 1970s and was very deliberate in tying uh, his end times theology to the politics and the eschatology, really, of oil. One of the most important books uh, that he authored at this time, selling millions of copies, I believe, was Armageddon, Oil and the Middle East Crisis. Walvard also spoke, of course, for Ronald Reagan's religious right, the most obvious indicator of wildcat Christianity's rise, uh, though in a curious way. Escalating anxiety over social issues certainly weighed on Walvard's political thought, just as it did on so many of the activists behind Reagan's right-wing movement. But festering worry about liberal drifts in energy and land use policy factored in as well. The heightened tensions of the 1970s oil embargo by OPEC and the Middle Eastern petroleum suppliers with whom men like William Eddy had worked so hard to befriend exacerbated the angst. 
as did the long lineups at the gas pumps that followed. Walverd's answers to the problem offered in the pages, again, of his best-selling text were unequivocal. Americans needed to be able to tap bountiful oil pools in the Gulf and Alaska, underneath southwestern soil and in the shale deposits of Colorado, once allowed to exercise their dominion at home on domestic soil, they would recapture peace and assurance in the securities of Christian community, individual industriousness, and fuel and family values. This was the motto that Reagan rewarded with political decree. As if to answer Walverd's wishes, Reagan appeared ready in 1980 not only to take his constituents' social values seriously, but to honor their environmental ones too. Reagan rewarded his evangelical supporters by assigning a couple of them to key administrative posts. One was C. Everett Koop, the Presbyterian layman uh, who would be named Surgeon General, a position that would thrust him into the middle of the abortion controversy, a tension historians have explored in great depth. The other was James Watt, a Pentecostal from Wyoming who shared Walvert's premillennialist beliefs and deep suspicions of the regulatory state and the environmental movement. As Secretary of the Interior, Watt would see to it that Wildcat Christianity's long-standing fears of federal encroachment on land and resources would find clear policy outlets. And in the spirit of the Southwest Oilers who had begun their fight against the New Deal order by confronting an Interior Secretary of a very different elt, uh, ilk, Harold Ickes, he would promise to restore custodianship of the oil patch to the people who had long worked it as theirs. Watt's career was short, uh, but it's safe to say that uh, his worldview lived on in the presidency of George W. Bush. Bush's own experience in the bo uh, boom-bust climate of Texas crude was in fact one of the factors that led him on his own personal journey to reform. He found an end to that journey in the Council of Pentecostal Evangelists, Arthur Blessett, who preached through a recession-plagued West Texas in the 1980s, and Billy Graham, with whom Bush prayed the sinner's prayer. Together, these counselors encouraged Bush to embrace a faith, a faith that blended enchantments of self-help with promises of personal redemption, millennial expectation, and the spiritual strength to survive. Survive he did in splendid fashion. A short time after his 1980s crisis, Bush wrote an upswing in Texas crude to corporate success, which allowed him to chase victory in another realm, uh, this one, of course, political. During his climb into national politics, he stayed true to the fuel, faith, and family values of his heritage. Two of his earliest initiatives as president reflected this indebtedness. First, he breathed life into a long dormant Republican initiative to open up Alaska's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to oil drilling. Next, he lobbied for a program that would allow Washington to dole out money to churches that wanted to operate community-centered social programs. Far from the conspiracy of right-wing power some pundits hinted at, these action by the, actions by the Bush presidency were in fact natural byproducts of a man and a mission forged, forged out of the sacro space of the West Texas oil patch. There are other indicators of an ascendant wildcat Christianity assuming great power in the age of evangelicalism. Indeed, the religious and political discourses and theologies of this cosmology uh, really continue to resonate today. Again, a few examples. Consider the prosperity gospel, a creation of men like Oral Roberts, whose health and wealth theologies can be traced to their own early and frequent encounters with outpourings of black gold in their southwest towns. Or the work of Pentecostal oilmen, American and Canadian alike, in Israel who are using the Old Testament teachings as their guide to new pools. Harold Hayseed Stevens and earlier Andy Sorrell Jr. have been key to this endeavor. Driven by strong belief in premillennialist teachings, charged with the radical egalitarianism that tells them anyone uh, whose faith was sufficient can access God and his special gifts, they have chased Israel's oil resources with abandoned and with the Israeli government's endorsement. And then there's, of course, the continued impact on politics, from Sarah Palin's brand of wildcat politics to that of the Koch brothers, whose pleas echo generations of wildcatters by demanding their rule of capture. 
Just last week, in fact, the New York Times published an extensive essay accounting for the 158 families uh, that have provided nearly half of the early money for efforts to capture the White House. It's fine. The bulk of Republican funds have come from the Southwest's most illustrious wildcatting families. Now, as much as the wildcatting ethic continues to impact American church and political life, it is not the only carbon gospel to have had an effect. Witness the naughty career of the Keystone Pipeline and the tangled politics of energy with which the US's current president has had to wrestle. While vulnerable to criticism from the wildcat right, Barack Obama's most difficult confrontations have been with the environmentalists on his left. His energy politics has suffered as a result. This was evident in early 2012 when Obama appeared in Cushing, Oklahoma to jumpstart an energy tour. The politician had work to do. He had to win re-election. Flanked by steel pipes, he laid out his all of the above energy strategy, which included more jobs for Americans, more oil development and infrastructure, more domestic production and less dependency on foreign oil, and more drive towards renewable energy and care of the environment. Obama's faithful cheered his sweeping promises for more. Who wouldn't? Yet as policy, the speech clanged with incongruities. Could Americans truly get more of everything with little cost? Would such an open-ended policy work, or would it merely succumb to stalemate and none of the above results? Despite the president's best effort to speak their lingo, wildcat Republican naysayers critiqued the president's speech as too wishy-washy. What truly stung the president, however, were the barbs from within his own Democratic camp. Environmentalists decried Obama's talk and tentative thinking. When he won the Democratic primaries in 2008, they noted, he had predicted that in his administration, quote, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow and the planet begin to heal. Yet in Cushing, he boasted about more oil development and pipelines encircling the earth. It makes no sense at all, one detractor wrote. Drilling everywhere you can and then putting up a solar panel is like drinking six martinis and then topping them off with a vitamin water. <laughs> You're still drunk. You just have your day's full allotment of vitamin C and D. <laughs> Obama is still drunk in oil, another critic averred, running with the theme. The worst speech ever, a third critic chimed in. Obama's presidential record further reveals this uncertainty. In the struggle over Trans-Canada's Keystone Pipeline, which insp inspired his Oklahoma visit, uh, then generated controversy during much of his second term in office, he spoke for and against the enterprise, urged construction in sections, delayed it in others, paused for environmental reassessment, and infuriated activists and Canadians, tough to do, with his indecision. One can safely say that from early to late in his presidency, Obama remained trapped in the conundrums of energy politics. One reason why is because of the traction of this other carbon gospel that expressed frustration with the president's lack of resolve. This carbon-free gospel is the product of another crude awakening in the 20th century, one I'd like to briefly highlight as a way to make better sense of our current moment. This requires an appreciation of oil's muckraking opponents, two in particular. The first muckraker is Ida Tarbell. It was Tarbell who, more than anyone else, raised a gospel of protest against the petroleum machine in the early 1900s, just as Americans were coming to terms with their energy revolution and its first, vic its first victims. The victims were rank and file inhabitants of petroleum's earliest hubs, whose livelihoods were threatened, as we've learned, by John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil. Rockefeller was puritanical in his view of oil. Besides deeming his extraction of crude providential, he believed truly that his corporate ventures were themselves acts of redemption designed to rescue the oil business from the chaos promoted by the rule of capture. As Ron Chernow writes, this Christian certainty gave Rockefeller a capacity to think in strategic terms, 
but also a messianic self-righteousness and contempt for those short-sighted mortals who made the mistake of standing in his way. The mortals saw him differently, of course, and clawed back with their own moral critique. And their champion was Tarbell, whose disdain of Rockefeller grew out of her wrestling with God and the ghosts of her youth. Born in 1857 in Western Pennsylvania, raised by devout Methodists, Tarbell was truly a product of the oil fields. As a child, she attended Sunday school. As a teen, she ventured with fellow Methodists one hour north to participate in the Chautauqua movement. And then, a few years later, she gained her journalistic know-how by becoming editor of the Chautauquan, the movement's paper. Even as she relocated to far-off cities during her 20s, she guarded the faith of her parents while supplementing it with new scientific thought. After attending chapel in Paris, she wrote her brother to express discomfort with Orthodox Christianity. I am just home from church, she wrote, where I heard a senseless sermon on heaven. If people who preached would only try to give a little more incentive to stay on earth and behave themselves for the sake of behaving themselves, instead of holding up heaven as a reward for merit, I'd have more hope for the church. Though assuming the theological flexibility and harboring some doubt, Tarbell remained firm in her Christian moralism. As her career in muckraking uh, began to flourish in journalism, uh, she found an outlet for her zeal in oil. In a very real way, oil had never left her imagination. When she was young, Tarbell's father, beloved for his gentleness, had entered the oil business, but Rockefeller's monopolizing killed his dream and generous outlook. In the cutthroat climate of Pennsylvania's oil patch, the Baptist Titan's rule of capture easily trumped that of the compliant Methodist. Tarbell carried her father's pain with her. Friends noted that Standard was, uh, that this uh, animosity was in fact a strong thread weaving itself into the very pattern of her life and her existence. The strains of this family history further inspired her to research Standard's internal workings and learn of Rockefeller's every move, including to church. In 1903, Tarbell's first expose of Standard appeared in McClure's magazine. In 1904, she published the mammoth history of the Standard Oil Company, which identified Rockefeller as the man who symbolized, quote, all that was wrong in national life. The Supreme Court's ruling of 1911, which dismantled Standard Oil into its various subsidiaries, further solidified Tarbell's legacy as a muckraking journalist extraordinaire. But she also bequeathed to future generations of oil's rank and file a doctrine of Christian justice. When fighting Rockefeller, she stressed the innately pure qualities of the local oil patch in which she grew up. Hers was not a condemnation of petrocapitalism so much as it was a petition to clean it up. Life went, ran swift and ruddy and joyous in these men, she wrote glowingly of men like her father. They looked forward with all the eagerness of the young who have just learned their powers. They would meet their own needs. There was nothing they did not hope and dare. Tarbell's faith in oil's first generation mirrored her belief in human ability to better society through smart application of biblical principles. To act on the essential teachings of the Bible, Tarbell asserted, was to strive in solitude and silence to enter into a fuller understanding of the divine. In sharp contrast to Rockefeller, small producing oil men like her father struck Tarbell as the last hope to recreate, perpetuate the whole and perfect man in the Bible sense. This Bible-based viewpoint matched her conviction that petrocapitalism had to remain egalitarian if it were to thrive. She theologized oil's land and labor too. Through readings in Methodism and socialism, she came to understand the struggle with standard as one to protect the value of small-scale production by individual laborers. God gave man the land, she would write, but man has to use his hand and brain in its cultivation before he can feed and clothe and shelter himself. It is the partnership of the two, land and labor, which produces wealth. 
Because of big oil, she lamented, labor had been made dependent on capital by capital's theft of the land which God gave to all. Though she could not imagine it at the time, her muckraking ethic of social justice attuned to the damages uh, that oil causes for the common person and their self-identity, and the realms of toil and community they inhabited would endure among men and women like her parents for generations to come. The crude awakening that Tarbell helped launch in the early 20th century is in many ways still with us in the early 21st, if in slightly different form. Whereas Tarbell targeted oils and justices to the human condition, the current carbon-free gospel targets injustice to the environment. Among, among the leading voices of this gospel, certainly one of the most eloquent, is Bill McKibben, grassroots leader of the anti-Keystone campaign. The Harvard-trained environmentalist made a name for himself in the 1990s and early 2000s as a spokesperson for the anti-carbon campaign group he founded, 350org, uh, and author of some of the most popular Jeremiads against global warming, none more heralded than The End of Nature, published in 1989. By 2010, his penmanship on behalf of these causes had vaulted him to international fame. In 2011, he shifted vocations from author activist to straight up activist. Inspired by the teachings of Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., he decided to enlist a small army of young activists in the fledgling anti-Keystone crusade. McKibben was convinced that the plan to process and move a million barrels a day of Alberta's tar sands to the Gulf of Mexico was a game changer and possibly game over for the climate. During 2011 and 2012, he held protests in Washington for which he spent three days in prison. His 2012 essay in Rolling Stone, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math, tore through social media and led one pundit to name him Nature's Prophet. In 2013, the Prophet won the Gandhi, Pro uh, Gandhi Peace Award. And then in fall of that year, he stepped up his rhetoric, promising a call to arms and ambition by co co uh, coordinating the People's Climate March in New York City, uh, which uh, enlisted some 300,000 marchers. With each step forward, McKibben became more deliberate in reaching back into the repositories of scripture and back to the land spirituality. In a way, his current view of oil as the ultimate moral test for humanity mirrors that of his predecessor, Ida Tarbell, with whom he shares his Methodism and a theological eclecticism that blends love of the Bible with awe of nature's mysteries and a transcendent, a transcendent view of terrestrial things. Today, tucked away in a Vermont valley, he writes amid waterways and foliage of the kind that inspired Tarbell to write in her Allegheny village. Little wonder that he has found further inspiration for his prose in Wendell Berry, whose Christian gospel of sustainability and back-to-the-land communalism is tuned to good husbandry. Still, McKibben's is also a theology, theology shaped by global exchange in a post-industrial age. The self-proclaimed Methodist Sunday school teacher has traveled the world conversing with Buddhists, Orthodox priests, and socialists while resisting their labels and choosing to apply the best that all of them can offer him and his homespun faith. Through these channels, he has accessed an inner light that has inspired his moral aggression against the petrol state on one hand, and on the other, his first desire to chase quietly woods east and west, words and gods, and hopes and fears. His followers love him for it. Though an admirer of Job, McKibben has been bestowed the title of New Noah by one of his organization's core constituencies, young evangelicals aligned with sojourners. Bill's been tapped to be the Noah to our faithless generation, they believe. It's his job to warn us that we have grieved the Lord in his heart and that the floodwaters will rise again if we don't get back to working with our original contract and reverse climate change. Alongside McKibben, these evangelicals have borrowed from ideas that resonate with Wendell Berry. They decry society's unreflective commitment to industrialism and modern technology, and the way, quoting a sojourner's essayist, that humans serve the economy, not vice versa. 
The proposed pipeline, this author asserts, is evidence that our modern technocratic myth-spinning machine is strangling God's world. Evangelicalism's rising radicals have acted out their convictions with McKibben by their side. Since 2012, they have initiated social media and prayer campaigns, lobbied public and corporate institutions to divest their portfolios of oil, pushed for heavier taxes on car carbon emitters, and educated their churches and communities. They have marched. Oil Patch Pentecostal and Baptist youth have journeyed from Texas to Washington to stand with McKibben, nuns, Mennonites, Quakers, ranchers, and indigenous, indigenous communities in opposition to the Keystone. In other isolated moments, they have traveled to Nebraska and Texas to chain themselves to bulldozers, pray on pipe, and use faith to subvert oil's order. And they have marched in Canada, too. One evangelist for the carbon-free gospel states it simply, many people see the pipeline as a political or an economic issue, but I see it as a moral issue. Invoking Charles Winnie, uh, Finney, uh, the 19th century revivalist, another proselyte promises a power shift. If people of faith rise up and demand that our nation turn away from the planet-threatening actions that have fed global warming, it will launch an irresistible force for change. But such a faith-based uprising will take a revival movement, every bit as significant as the Great Awakenings led by Finney. We need a faith of revival on behalf of the world as God intends, a planet where life not simply survives but thrives, a creation where God is at the center and delights in it. McKibben would disagree with this evangelical only on one score. The fires of revival, he would charge, are already burning bright. Of course, we don't need McKibben and his activists to tell us that we're encountering perhaps yet another crude awakening in the, fir in the uh, first decades of the 21st century. It's premature, of course, to declare a paradigm shift, but realignments between God and black gold are emerging on more than one plane. Recent battles over the Keystone Pipeline has, for one thing, and as I've just indicated, exposed growing division within evangelicalism over the efficacy of the wildcat imperative. Now, it's important to note, uh, as I've tried to uh, hint at in my previous lectures, that this imperative's environmental record is more complex than historians or critics have allowed. For one thing, when wildcatters like Patilla Higgins and his company poked at the planet, the planet often poked back, often with massive disruption. And even the most muscular wildcatters tended to acknowledge the response. Moreover, in their explorations, many oil hunters conveyed wonder about the environment. Oil was their step towards ecological understanding. And in their grappling with booms and all of its trials, oil patch citizens often fought for an ethic of conservation that was, in many regards, surprisingly advanced. The grit under their fingernails served to remind them that they were custodians of nature, God's champion of creation care. Still, in current Keystone Wars, we're privy to a potential break in, e in the evangelical community between stalwarts of the old order, allegiances to oil are indeed difficult to break, and young dissenters who aren't just entertaining but demanding different handling of God's garden. A second evidence of a potential new crude awakening and perhaps most striking of all is that some of Petro-Protestantism's oldest nemeses now find themselves on the same side. In the recent push to ban the Keystone and force Obama into a veto of the project, uh, something he has followed through with, it is the heirs of the John D. Rockefeller oil fortune that are helping lead the charge and the broader initiative to divest funds from fossil fuel investments. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund is among hundreds of foundations and organizations, including the Federal Council of Churches, that have pledged to withdraw a total of $50 billion. John D. Rockefeller moved America out of whale oil and into petroleum, Stephen Heinz, president of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, explains. We are quite convinced that if he were alive today, as an astute businessman looking out to the future, he would be moving out of fossil fuels and investing in clean, renewable energy. 
Imagine the Rockefellers out of oil. Most interesting of all, perhaps, is the loyal partner that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund has found in its drive against dirty oil. Ongoing protests of the Canadian oil sands now pit several green billionaires against the Canadian government and extractive practices that threaten the land. Joining the Rockefellers in this camp of well-endowed anti-oil sands activists is the Pew Foundation. One can only imagine what J. Howard Pugh, whose name now graces one of Fort McMurray's favorite family parks, would think of this arrangement. As we step away from the particularities of America's hydrocarbon zones and beyond the recent history of this topography, we also see hints of a bigger story of momentous change, one deeply textured by remarkable religious plurality. Ironically, it's a story that wildcat Christians like the Pews help create. One strand of this new narrative suggests that the exceptionalism Henry Luce and William Eddy proclaimed for their carbon-rich country and its carbon-hungry citizens is no longer America's to enjoy alone. Of course, oil was never America's to claim. Petroleum was a global phenomenon from the start, impossible for any one country to master. And the countless ambassadors of U.S. petroleum and religion who went out into the world to educate peoples in the fantastic possibilities of the black stuff helped spur other theologies of oil's blessedness, other myths of exceptionalism. As we look out onto a world of struggle over oil's resources, it is apparent that God and black gold are still alive and active as an empowering unity if in different guises on behalf of different peoples. Another irony is that despite the specifics of their doctrine, the cosmology of crude to which these different peoples are all beholden has in some ways created a universal effect. As glimpsed in his, these images, the mechanisms of petrol capitalism have reproduced remarkably similar oil patches around the globe on which acts of summoning subsurface wealth, training engineers in a, in a scientific and moral absolute, and housing workers assume striking uniformity. On landscapes such as this one where pumps and derricks encircle mosques, acts of piety assume certain uniformities as well. In these impermanent boom towns, on these vulnerable dreamscapes, where the temporality of everything nags at the soul and where an inevitable future of depletion weighs heavily on the present, praying to an all-powerful being who giveth and taketh suddenly but who always persists makes perfect sense. So too does framing life's surprising bursts of health and wealth as a miraculous interlude in an otherwise difficult slide towards cataclysmic end. Wildcat Christians, such as those who populated the East Texas countryside in the 1930s when oil appeared, might not find these foreign terrains so foreign. Indeed, considering the pervasiveness of this eschatology, are Odessa, Texas, and Oman as different as their residents tend to believe? It's also fascinating to see that the world J. Howard Pugh, Lyman Stewart, and Jake Simmons helped create, and the one Henry Luce affirmed, is now bending back on Americans. Amid the current boomerangs of global Christianity and oil, waves of workers are streaming from Nigeria to Houston, South Asia to Alberta and Alaska, supplying fresh labor and fresh excitement about crude's redemptive potential. Gathered in their churches, worshiping in a range of dialects, Nigerian Pentecostals in Houston, South Asian Muslims in Fort McMurray still speak of oil's imperatives and impositions in a familiar theological idiom. Finally, as we anticipate new progressions of God and black gold on our own soil, we can also see an intensification of apprehension. Oil is supercharging the US. Oil boom lifts US economy. These and other claims have graced the covers of major magazines, confirming that crude remains our society's lifeblood. But churches that occupy North Dakota and Texas drill sites where fracking permeates vernacular speech are also expressing worry about, the, about oil's effects on the country's spiritual health. Of recent trends, they're asking, at what cost to the soul? 
This line of questioning puzzles some pundits, for why should spirituality be factored in any bottom line assessment of crude? They might puzzle less once they recognize that oil patch citizens in particular harbor a profound sensitivity to the imaginative and transcendent potentials as well as the volatile, sometimes violent realities of life on their terrain, on their sacro space. No mere question of economic interest, their investment in oil was and remains totalizing. Thank you. <laughs>